Well, in my presentation, I wanted to fill in, remind what was to supplement with new latest experiments were made here in Shenzhen. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, the financial state of the company I work for here, well, it doesn't let me do what I want, but like what's possible was done. Wanted a big car, got a small one, the 16 inches, wanted it different. Make a magnetic system, but the Chinese made it. They know better. Yes, they did it their way. Well, all right. I'll tell you on the way. Well, so what? Let's start from the very beginning. Well, what is MIX? It's magnetic energy converter. Initially, we gave it such a name, so I will stick to that name. This is some kind of energy generating device, primarily producing mechanical energy. This mechanical energy can be converted into electricity uh, as it's generated on the device's shaft. Moreover, it was observed that this device had the effect of changing weight depending on the direction of the rotor's rotation. Presumably, the converter interacts with an almost unlimited energy source known as dark energy or zero-point energy. It can be transformed into a mechanical or electromagnetic form suitable for ordinary use. Uh, uh, an interesting effect during the converter's operation was the decrease in air temperature around the operating device, resulting in thermal and magnetic cylindrical walls, as well as changes in the device's weight and their working load. It's important to emphasize, especially when the load, when power is drawn from the device, that is when an active load is connected to the generator, it affects the change in weight. The greater the load, the more the weight of the device changes. Here's a consultative model built to resemble the roller bearing with a stationary with a, a central cylindrical magnet from the series of rotating magnetic rollers around the perimeter. It only required a booster engine to operate. The car sped up to about 300 to 400 revolutions, and then the machine became energy independent. The rotor began to self-accelerate, and it had to be slowed down by connecting an increasingly heavy load to the generator. Mm. At maximum load, it lost weight at around 6 kilowatts, approximately 35% of the platform's total weight. If, if compared to the weight of the magnetic system, it essentially equals the weight of the rollers, somewhere around 120 to 130 kilograms, the roller's weight. Essentially, during the machine's operation, the rollers became weightless, you could say. Here, around the car, the temperature dropped by about 6 by 8 degrees, but I will elaborate later. Mm. Why did I call this method progressive? Because uh, it's like a new way of producing energy and creating thrust at the same time. Plus innovative cooling technology. Meaning you don't need a coolant like in regular fridges. And there's no need for direct contact with the item you want to cool. That is actually, if you have a fish container... You can cool this fish right through the wall. Then the wall. Then there was some kind of synergistic effect. The lower the temperature, the higher the output power. More holiday electricity. And it turns out that so you're lowering the temperature around or somewhere within a given object, you get electricity. If this electricity is directed towards producing, let's say, green hydrogen through with water electrolysis, you can get liquefied gas, liquid hydrogen on the spot through cooling. Well, as people usually say, this technology is eco-friendly. Hmm? So I think it will receive the best development soon. Hmm. So, so sure. What to say? We got a Russian patent, then got an American patent. 
There were presentations at international conferences in America and Switzerland and uh, in the magazine too. In the academic journal Letters in Jet, a brief article was published actually for which I was kicked out. Uh, the instage, though. Good luck. Uh, uh, now, if we talk uh, about documents published online, the most complete and accurate description here, uh, you can find it at this address. Everything else is just fantasies. Reprints of something from somewhere, some drafts, somehow leaked online. Eh? Now, if we talk about the history of the issue, initially, hmm, John Searle's generator variant. We read in the, in the German magazine Raum Insight. It's a magazine like the Russian Technology of Youth. This magazine published a rather complex technology on magnetizing magnets with high-frequency magnetization, with a complex compositional makeup of magnets. Overall, it seemed complicated to us, but the idea itself seemed very interesting. Why? Because at that time, uh, I was interested thinking about how a tornado works. And the structure seemed very similar to a tornado to me. That is, some vortices are formed. Spinning, powered by heat, mm. it affects the environment and generally generates some additional mechanical energy, lifting objects into the air, moving them around and so on. Overall, after reviewing these materials in Roman site, we decided to go for it. Geometrically, about the same design, but using ready-made magnets. Cobalt samarium magnets were used. Produced here in Moscow at the specialized magnetic enterprise. As you can see in this drawing, it's a rough schematic of, uh, of the machine's construction. There's a first the first central magnet, cylindrical, was glued together from individual pieces. There surrounding it were 23 rollers. Uh, the entire structure had a diameter of about one meter and uh, had a booster engine. And there was also a generator essentially mounted on the same gear. The car accelerated with a booster engine equipped with an overrunning clutch when after reaching certain revolutions, essentially this clutch disengaged and a standard generator was activated. The platform was mounted on springs and uh, the movement of this platform was simply recorded by a standard inductive displacement sensor, which uh, was calibrated in a static mode. The platform was loaded with normal weight. This sensor's response looked in such a way it was possible to determine how much the weight of the machine changes during its operation. Uh, additionally, some things were made. Magnetic cores with coils to which additional load was connected. Light bulbs... They turned out to be of, uh, of no practical value, even though they were described in Raum Insight magazine, but it was like for energy harvesting, for the machine to operate. They played no role at all, and later on we completely abandoned them. Uh, the, uh, uh, moving on, it means this was simply reviewed. The single row converter version we used was made from several layers of magnets. The reels were also made from disc magnets and were equipped with some kind of magnetic inserts. They are depicted in the right drawing. On the roller and the central magnet were separately embedded magnets with a different direction of the magnetic field. Thus, these uh, rollers engaged magnetically, essentially forming a magnetic gear. The rollers were tightly attached to the central magnet when uh, the, the rollers on a special device moved around the central magnet. 
they began to rotate precisely because of the magnetic coupling. So here, it pretty much as we did it, uh, such a special construction of steel. This with many bolts was made because the repulsive force of these magnets was terrible. And each magnet had to be pressed down with steel bolts until the glue dried. Here on the right is a video. You can see two, uh, two strips, I see, equipped with these magnetic insertions. It's clear that the reel is assembled from discs. The weight of the reel is approximately five kilogram, and the reel is not shown here, but the roller was equipped with bearings. Initially, we used stainless steel bearings made at the Samara factory. It was the best at the time, but then as it turned out, significant eddy currents are induced in them. So these bearings were replaced with Japanese ceramic ones. Made of ceramic, they induced no currents and required no lubrication. Here's the picture. Magnetic and thermal walls that formed around the machine. Here the machine is schematically shown and at a distance uh, 15 meters in radius from this machine. Magnetic walls formed. So what's interesting, the magnetic field intensity on all walls was about the same, around 50 milliteslas. This was measured. A Russian made magnetometer F4355 based on uh, using the hollow, uh, the hollow sensor. The hollow sensor was small in size, about a millimeter by millimeter. When we, we measured the magnetic field's uh, strength in the walls with this sensor, it was quite surprising. The walls had very sharp edges. A shift of one millimeter was enough for the sensor to show 50 milliteslas and immediately it showed zero. The same scene was observed with thermometers too. Several types of thermometers were used to measure temperature because it all looked very suspicious. It doesn't seem like it was purely warmth because if the air was heated, there's some warmth. There should be diffusion. It seems like there was no diffusion here. There was a very sharp boundary inside. Inside this boundary, within this wall, the temperature dropped by 6 to 7 degrees just as you step outside. And immediately the temperature was back to normal room level. The results are the same. Showed all three thermometers. We used a mercury thermometer was used, an alcohol thermometer was used, and an electronic thermometer was used. They showed the same result. It feels like temperature, but still somewhat odd. It was, let's say, strange. There's also a feature of these magnetic walls. Starting from the radius, the distance between the walls gradually increased. If the, the initial walls were spaced apart, a distance equal to the rotor's radius in the magnetic machine, the last walls were in half a meter apart, but closer to 0 0.7 meters, maybe even 0.8. And after 50 meters, they abruptly disappeared. What was on top? How high these walls stretched? I couldn't say. All I can say mm. that on the second floor of the building, they were also visible. That is about 16 feet is what they seemed. And anything above that, I can't say. Maybe they were rubbing. Maybe they were closing. Uh, to me, this is... There is a theory that they did close up, but closed up much higher above. Meaning these walls, they were like enclosed, similar to how magnetic field lines are. Mm. We have a source, like some kind of power tubes through which energy flowed. Let's move on. Huh? Uh, this graph shows how the temperature drop in the magnetic walls depended on the rotor's rotation speed. Huh? 
somewhere out there. In fact, it can vary there. 250 or 300 rotations are needed for the effect to start. And here is another thing in uh, important. The effect doesn't start immediately. It feels like something is uh, accumulating around this machine. It takes about one and a half minutes for it to work. And after that, uh, some substance has already accumulated, has formed, and is beginning to show the main effect. When this effect appears, that's when we can start building. We were increasing the speed to 600 rotations per minute. At this rate, the output power grows, tension grows within the magnetic walls, and the temperature drops. Well, you see, if, say, you quickly stop the machine at this moment and quickly start it again, the effect basically repeats quickly, and you don't have to wait an hour and a half. Minute is still not accumulating. In essence, uh, replicating these experiments here in Shenzhen, we found the same effect, but it manifested a bit differently. And I'll tell you later. Another interesting effect was the formation of a crown around the magnetic system. A pale blue glow like you see with a typical corona discharge and the smell of ozone. Well, presumably it's not ozone, I believe. Uh, but nitrogen dioxide, because nitrogen doesn't smell, there's no odor. Uh, interestingly, about six bands were observed along the length of the video. Let's assume we have some kind of standing electromagnetic wave formed by rollers, then the length. The wavelength is about 10 centimeters. If you do a simple calculation, you'll find that 10 centimeters is a frequency of 3 GHz corresponding to cyclotron, uh, electron cyclotron resonance at a magnetic field strength of one tenth of a Tesla. But it's kind of like this might or might not be, it could be of a different nature. But if the intensity around the rollers roughly matches 0 0.1, it's entirely possible that the Tesla 2 is being generated frequencies around 3 gigahertz, creating such a standing wave. So, here's what I want to say, like, we're not alone. Mm. On the right, you can, uh, on the left, you can see a photo of a certain machine. Runar Nikolaevich Kuzmin gave me this little machine from the university. We tested it too. How she got to him and how he made her, I don't really know, just trial data. We, we spun it around, ran some tests, but didn't find anything unusual. There were attempts to make a tiny car. Will it work or not? Uh, they made really tiny machines, rotors from different magnets, uh, which accelerated to high speed until everything melted and shattered into pieces. Here's the picture on the far right. Uh, an American tried to replicate this machine too, made it a similar structure, but used uh, plastic discs for mounting rollers. Our discs were made of titanium. But it seems he also got nowhere with it. It didn't activate. He experienced neither a drop in temperature nor an increase in power output. Still, it's such a construction, a machine made it in the same way, made it of ferrite magnets. What is interesting here is there are no disks holding the rollers. It's designed after a pattern. Runa Kuzmin Nikolaevich's machines. This central magnet is mounted on the engine shaft, and it is specifically the central magnet that rotates due to eddy currents. Rollers start spinning around it. The same design is applied here as well. Here, a large ferrite magnet rotates. 
Due to eddy currents, you can see copper casings here. These rollers start spinning. Well, the author didn't inform us about any positive effect. He mentioned the test was conducted, but there was no effect. See, on the right, a car assembled from not a single ion eater among magnets. In Moscow, it was already assembled, full size, but unfortunately, it refused to work. It just didn't feel like it, that's all. There is also independent confirmation that the cooling effect exists. Uh, a few years ago on YouTube, a guy with the nickname Mr. Dolphin posted a video made of 22 or 25 parts where he assembled uh, a similar machine had its central part spinning. The central part was made of a ferret magnet and had something inserted in the center. A core made of pure neodymium was inserted. Mm here and what did he find video these are bits of an image from a full video the video is available if anyone's interested i can show it well i had it saved it's not on youtube but it was preserved and what did this person discover when speeding up to about 500 to 600 revolutions in a minute, its structure started cooling down. And the area above the rollers was cooled. He has a temperature sensor here. It might not be very clear. And what was his report? The initial air temperature was about 16 degrees. When, when the device was operational, the temperature of its rotor and the surrounding environment dropped to 11.5 degrees. Well, it's not six or seven degrees like we have, but still, it's quite a statement since the device is of a small size. Uh, it looks to be about 30, 35 centimeters in diameter, and yet it shows a cooling effect. There's another one. Eh? Uh, this very person's video where the temperature drops to minus 10 degrees, I have pictures from this video. By the way, like you, can, uh, you can watch this video on YouTube. Some guy has saved it. Thanks a lot to him. Uh, and uploaded it. Here is a video made together with um, thermal... A device called a thermal imager visually shows which areas are hot and which are cold as you can see in the image on the right roller areas uh, it actually cools down by seven and a half degrees then upon further spinning it turned out that the area rollers the bottom and left picture cool down to minus 10 degrees and the central magnet begins to cool down not the central magnet more precisely a rod just a cylinder made of neodymium, pure neodymium. Here, all these effects are very noticeable at speeds of 374, 20 revolutions per minute. But these speeds are very similar. The smaller the diameter, the higher the speed needs to be. Here in the right picture, he even takes his finger in a glove, runs it across the surface of neodymium and frost forms on it. And the snow is melting on his finger, really. So what's next? Here's this picture of the gadget that's now made in Shenzhen. Uh, there's the, the same construction, a stationary stator. Although I asked for the stator to be movable too, because it's very interesting to see what will happen when the central magnet moves simultaneously and the rollers move around this central magnet let's say the rollers rotate clockwise the central magnet also rotates clockwise will these effects be observed or not but the chinese did it better as they understand so because of that this the central magnet is stationary well there are 23 rollers but it can rotate around it 
first they made me such big aluminum wheels as they like to use. They love to make everything out of aluminum in general. I insisted later that this disc be replaced with dielectric ones because the rollers need to accumulate charges. If the discs are aluminum, then these charges will flow to the grounded central part. This means the picture shows a stand where all these tests are conducted. Uh, there's an accelerator engine, an oscilloscope to monitor the sensors. There's a temperature logger, nine channel through, uh, through which we monitor temperature. There are several types of magnetic sensors. Working in the low frequency and high frequency areas, let's see what's happening. There's a high voltage source, so high voltage can be applied there. Uh, to the left in the picture is depicted systems of electrodes to which high voltage is applied for activation. Uh, this slide simply shows a certain stage of manufacturing here on the right. This was a plastic clip and the plastic clip was packed with small magnets. Here, despite the fact that I I spent a long time at the factory drawing and explaining how the magnets should be positioned. They still didn't take a special opinion, as they understand. But nevertheless, what's done is done. So uh, a special magnet sensitive film is used here to visualize the magnetic field of the central magnet. You can see spots here. These are marks from the magnetic inserts. The rollers are shown on the right. Here they are equipped with small ceramic bearings. They're, they're small in size with a diameter of 1.5 inches, height about 1.9 inches. And here's a problem that uh, it formed, and I didn't notice it at first. The thing is the gap between the magnetic inserts on the central magnet and on the rollers must be exactly the same. It seems they did what was convenient for them. The step turned out to be inconsistent. As a result, the rollers don't pick up speed. Instead of having 10 roller revolutions per one rotation, mm -hmm. as a result, we ended up with only 4.5. Because of this, the further effects we observed on this machine were not as vivid as before. Here is the roller construction. We've assembled a small stand where we test each roller. It has losses due to eddy outcomes, and there are bearing losses roughly. Say, for each roller, if it's accelerated to working speed, it takes about 50 watts each. Eddy current loss and bearing loss. Uh, Right in the center, there's a diagram of a roller construction made from individual neodymium iron boron disc magnets and magnetic inserts, which located at the top and bottom of the video. Here are the roller dimensions shown. Two types of rollers were made, ones with a brass shell and uh, others just without any shell because of the shell. In essence, it can play a significant role because it induces eddy currents. These eddy currents can facilitate the emergence bad occurrence of plasma fractures. Let's put it that way. Uh, and here, the construction is shown next. Uh, there is a booster engine controlled by a frequency drive belt drive connected right there to a generator with a load. Mm. On the right, the load is shown. That's 24 lamps were used. Half a kilowatt each and every row of lamps can be turned on and off, meaning we can adjust the load. Uh, the rest of the platform is resting on about sensors that measure the platform's weight. Such serious sensors, uh, load cells, which determine weight. Here's what interesting came out of these tests. 
these are thermal imaging pictures. If you look to the left, we begin to accelerate it. Cars, after a while, eh, you can see that some rollers are hot, the bearings are warming up, and uh, eddy currents occur. Here, some rollers are hot, some are cold. After reaching a certain critical speed, you can see on the right, you can see that the upper part where the rollers are, it's cold, but at the bottom, you can tell the bearing is heated. It's a large bearing, a large steel bearing that supports the entire platform. Huh? And the temperature drop in this clips was at its maximum. Uh, on the best settings, it's just one and a half degrees. But one and a half degrees was still noticeable. Instead of them heating up from eddy currents and from friction, they didn't cool down. Uh, what else can I add? Uh, we know the losses in each reel at a certain speed measured on the stand. It turns out that with a temperature drop of about one degree, one to one and a half degrees, the machine is in operation, mm. but it lacks what it takes to go into self-acceleration mode. The total motor transmission consumption is about 500 watts. And the machine produces 200. Right now is the moment. Here, it's just a bit short, back in the video speed. So what else was interestingly noted? Uh, here's this curve, uh, several eight temperature sensors, which were placed at different distances. Unfortunately, we did not witness the formation magnetic and thermal walls, we observed individual pulsations. Here, the machine is tested in various modes. A logger is writing temperature data. And here we observe uh, that from time to time, the temperature suddenly drops. Then it goes back up. Then it suddenly drops again. Then it goes back up. And the closer the sensor is to the machine, see the green, the green curve. That sensor was placed right under the roller. And uh, the black curve is the logger's body temperature located about two meters from the machine. But the rest of the sensors were placed about 15 centimeters apart from each other, starting from the center of the machine. They essentially all repeat each other, but with varying degrees of emphasis. So, what else? A very important thing that we hadn't seen before but have discovered now is something happening with the sound. The sound goes somewhere. Here are two spectra shown uh, the green curve. This is the sound generated by the machine. Let's say uh, in pre-critical mode. Here is the blue curve when we've gone beyond the critical mode and came back to, to ensure the same speed. Mm. Here, the sound, uh, the intensity of the sound, and moreover, the intensity of the high frequency sound, noise levels could drop to 20 decibels. Just the machine humming, buzzing, no? It was whistling before, but then it suddenly becomes quiet. And notably... So the emergence of this silent mode, mm. it's linked to a drop in temperature. As soon as this quiet mode is detected, it means we can record a temperature drop on the sensors. How to explain this effect? I, I find it difficult to do this because bearings are pure mechanics. They always make noise. The faster and the heavier the load, the louder it is. Here it uh, turns out that they are making noise until a certain point. But for some time, then suddenly everything disappears. We have two sets of rollers. On some rollers, this effect is clearly visible, while on others, it is not. The bearings don't affect it. It depends on something else. Uh, it's possible something generated around this machine causes these rollers to cool down and the same phenomenon affects the sound generated by these videos.
And here Valery Nikolaevich inspired us to conduct an experiment with a sealed can. Here on the left, a can like that is depicted into which a sensor was placed. But my Chinese engineers did everything their own way, of course. They stuffed it with a huge amount of lithium batteries. Well, apparently for it to work a year without stopping, take this can airtight lid. The lid is actually greased with vacuum grease regarding this here. It's ensured to be airtight. Uh, it's unclear what these batteries might emit. Moisture can be absorbed. Some gases might be emitted. I can't be sure. Overall, this structure needs reworking, but I decided to still experiment with what we have. And here's what resulted on the top graph. This is the pressure inside this can. After the car starts and the recording begins, the pressure starts to drop. It just falls. And then from a certain point, it gradually, gradually, gradually increases. Then right here around four in the afternoon, the car shuts off. That means the car's operation stopped and the car's automation had no effect on either the pressure in the jar or the temperature, not on humidity. Interestingly, with the increase of the temperature inside, the pressure in this can should be rising, but in theory, the pressure continues to fall. In general, these experiments should be repeated, but nevertheless, I decided to show them. It's not so simple even with such simple experiments. Oh, by the way, the same Bosch BME 280 sensor was used inside, just like Parhomov used in his experiment. Now I wanted to fantasize a bit about how this machine works. The rotor starts spinning from an external source initially. When uh, reaching resonance speed, a sort of cylindrical thrust begins to form around the magnetic system. A vortex structure, presumably made of closed ether threads. Whirlwind clothes, they go through rollers, magnetic system, and it spreads out in the space around this machine. Vortexes gather energy in the surrounding space in effect and carry it to rabbits, exciting an electronic wave. Solid state plasma and maintaining high frequency circularly polarized oscillations in them. The so-called helicons, as is known, if you have metal and you it's magnetized along the axis, so a circularly polarized wave uh, can pass along the axis of magnetization. Those are the high frequency glowing oscillations we observed. Uh, apparently, they are related to these waves. These oscillations cause pulsations of the magnetic field in the rollers. And if we have pulsation, it means we can have the occurrence of a rotational moment. Hmm? In principle, after this, there should be positive feedback and the machine should switch to self-sustaining mode. If you have a standard active load, it ultimately converts all the energy into heat. This heat is released back into the environment and the process closes on itself. This is a basic, somewhat rough schematic. Of course, we can... There are many questions to ask, many concerns, but still we must try to explain something. How does all this work? Here, essentially, a vortex map is depicted. Mm. Vortex structure, uh, vortex filaments. These filaments carry energy to rollers and excites these rollers. An interesting moment is... The question is how torque arises in the first place. We've supplied energy to the rollers, but that doesn't mean a roller will start spinning on its own. Considering the presence of current threads around the magnetic system, we must also assume the rotation of magnetic walls around the center of the machine and the power interaction of the magnetic field of the rollers and current filaments. The car is somewhat similar to an AC asynchronous motor. Hmm. Maximum torque is reached only in a narrow range of speeds. And exceeding it leads to a sharp breakdown. 
Intuitively, it's clear that the speed providing maximum torque depends on the number of rollers, their diameter and height, as well as the speed of energy transfer in vortex filaments. Imagine these vortex filaments are made of some sort of substance like ether or from something else that still has some finite speed of energy transfer. The energy is transferred from the outer area where the temperature is higher to the rollers. It takes a little bit some time to do this. During this time, the wheel manages to advance by a certain angle. Alpha, as depicted in this picture, and it turns out that uh, some interaction of fields occurs. And just as in an asynchronous alternating current motor at a certain phase shift, wheels can accelerate just like that. It can form a certain running plasma wave, say around rollers, which also due to phase shift and waves and the position of the wheel can give them a twisting moment. So why is this? It might be close to reality because there is observation that if we rotate it, we rotate the machine counterclockwise into the sky, there arises some upward thrust. It loses weight. But if we start spinning the machine clockwise, then this thrust is directed downwards. It turns out as if the machine interacts with the field it has created itself. That is, currents occur in this pain. It's unclear, yes, what is the carrier of these currents, but let's say in a book, Peichkova and Zeitzer explain that it could be ether. This could be etheric outcomes. Well, if that's the case, then how about the car? It's explained that there is a certain token in the space. These currents form a general magnetic field, and the machines are essentially pulled into the density in the non-uniformity of the magnetic field. The effect of the magnetic field depends on the direction of the currents. With one rotation, you have one polarity. With another rotation, you have a different polarity. Thus, one might try to explain the generation of thrust in a machine. Huh? There were also attempts to explain the emergence of thrust. I remember one fellow sent me a letter. Imagine you have a barrel a spinning, just an empty barrel. And there's a hole made in this barrel. And so into this barrel, let's say, air leaks from either the top or the bottom. You start spinning this barrel quickly and you get thrust. Oh, well, sort of, uh, to which I replied, uh, the pull does not depend on which way this barrel is turning. But in our design, the pull does indeed depend on the direction in which the magnetic system rotates. He did not further develop his theory. Uh, in principle, I wanted to finish here and hear your questions. I'll be happy to answer questions if I can.